This morning, we continue with a series of questions posed by the religious leaders to challenge Jesus. So far in them, Jesus has taught about the Christian's relationship with God and the government and about the nature of the resurrection. But I'm so glad to be answering this question on this day. In it, Jesus is going to answer the question of the greatest commandment, and the answer is love. Love God and love your neighbor. I'm so glad to be discussing this passage today because the day in which those of us from Springville are going to be focusing on it is Mother's Day, a day in which we celebrate mothers for their sacrificial love for their families. To all of our moms, happy Mother's Day. And to Sam, you are a wonderful and beautiful mother. If only the circumstances in which Jesus answered the question were as joyful and celebratory as the occasion is for us, when in fact Jesus stood as a man on trial. Each of the groups of religious leaders is coming to Jesus, peppering him with questions. The price of a wrong answer is an abrupt end to his ministry by either disillusionment from his followers at best and at worst, a death sentence. No pressure. I've wrestled with whether this third question threatens the same danger. Because on one level, the scribe asking the question affirms Jesus' answer to the Sadducees. The text says in verse 28, seeing that Jesus answered them well. Later on, the scribe agrees with Jesus in his third answer. Mark records, and the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, in verse 32. Jesus even affirms the scribe's statement as the conversation continues and concludes, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You could conclude that Jesus has now come to a sympathetic questioner who simply is interested in his opinion. However, the Pharisees and the Herodians also paid lip service to Jesus as a teacher. But that was just their cloak, hiding the dagger. The same group even marveled at Jesus' answer in Mark chapter 12, verse 17. But having silenced one question, there simply came another with the same level of danger. So also this man does not just conclude he's answered the question well. No more questions and leave him alone. He takes his chance to continue the interrogation. M Matthew, who records the same drama, records in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 36, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? If this is the case, the tag team against Jesus just continues, and he is still very much in danger. The question posed to Jesus is, which is the most important commandment? The question was a pretty common one. The Jewish rabbis had concluded that there were 613 laws in the book of Moses. Some they categorized as heavy, while others they deemed light. Jesus, soon after the Matthew account, even addressed this philosophy by accusing the Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters, the heavier matters, of the law justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Just because the question, though, was a common one, didn't make the answer any less dangerous. R.T. France, in his Matthew commentary, in the New International Commentary of the New Testament series, stated, but to provide this must involve choosing one legal principle over the others. And this carried the risk that other teachers who might have made a different choice could accuse their colleague of belittling the importance of some other equally scriptural principle. Any answer must risk pleasing some at the expense of alienating others. And therein, perhaps, is the element of a test from an unsympathetic dialogue partner, particularly in the view of the suspicion already noted about Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that Jesus had come to, quote, abolish the law. If he differed radically from the mainstream Jewish orthodoxy, this question ought to reveal it. So here's our text for the day in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 24. 
It says in Mark 12, 28, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and that there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Though the question posed to Jesus is a theological one, it's a very practical answer, shaping the lives and souls of those who want to follow Jesus. His answer is love. The first part of Jesus' answer would have been considered a very orthodox one. He quotes from the Hebrew prayer called the Shema. It's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, and has been recited every morning and every evening for thousands of years by Jews dedicating themselves to God. The prayer every morning and every evening sounds something like this. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, Bechol Lehavcha, Ovechol Nafshecha, Ovechol Moedecha. I find it beautiful. Of course, in English it is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. I know that it's an easy thing to simply do things from repetition with no consideration of meaning. But I want to ask you this. How much would your life change and your relationship with God change if every morning the first thing on your lips was a reminder to love God with everything? Every part of you, everything that you have, every thought, every word, every step, everything. It would set the course for your entire day, knowing that what you do reflects your love for God. And then to end the day with the same reminder. The same prayer that says that God doesn't want just a part of you. He doesn't want the leftovers, an hour here or an hour there. He wants all of you. This is the greatest commandment. But Jesus isn't done yet. They ask him for one commandment, but Jesus isn't trapped by their question. He's going to give them a second. Thus, he turns his attention to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? What does it look like? We live in a society who uses the same word for love to describe a mother's relationship with her baby and a person's obsession with tacos. The line that Jesus quotes is the climax, though, in a section that includes various commands, like be generous to the poor, don't steal or lie, be fair, don't, or be kind to the handicapped, uphold justice, don't show favoritism, don't slander, don't retaliate. Loving your neighbor is not a single isolated act. It's the love that inspires us to do a thousand little things and a thousand big things that illustrate loves. Though these are two commandments that Jesus gives, they're not unrelated. John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 through 21. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 19, he says, We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he whom, who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. 
I always found it interesting that in chapter 4, verse 19, he simply says, we love. But in the sentence, he doesn't give a direct object. He doesn't say who we love. Do we love God? Do we love people? The answer is yes. Having been loved by God motivates love for God and for other people. Jesus says that there's no law greater than these. So we've come to the end of these series of questions to Jesus. The scribe is left in agreement. The questioners are left silent. And you would think then that Jesus is out of danger. But he isn't. They will come again and again. And Jesus knows it. But this is love. He knows they'll keep coming. He knows eventually they will concoct a reason to end his life. But he loves us. He loves us too much to run. He loves us too much not to die. Can I just end by saying, what an amazing Savior we serve. I do want to give you some questions to wrap this up, some questions for you to consider. The first is not really a question, more of a challenge for you. I want you to commit to reciting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5 every morning and every evening for one week. And I want you to trace over the course of the week how it impacts your thinking and actions. But before you begin, answer this question. What kinds of changes do you anticipate with that being your daily practice? The second question is this. I want you to just complete the sentence. I'm going to love my neighbor today by, and then fill in the blank. How can you love your, show your love for your neighbor today? And then the third question that I want you to consider is, we love because he first loved us, right? First John chapter 4, verse 19. I want you to list five things that God has done for you that inspire you to love him and love other people. Thank you for enjoying this passage with me today, and I, am, I hope you too are inspired to more love.